All right, I'll turn it over to Jim, who will introduce today's speaker. All right, everyone. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kelly Zamudio. Um, two time, noted two time alumna of UC Berkeley and the UBC, which I'll get to in a moment when we go through the bio. Um, Kelly's one of the most important people in my field. She's also one of my favorite people in the field. I just feel like I needed to say that. <laughs> like a lot of people share that opinion of, of Kelly. Um, so Kelly did her undergrad here at Berkeley. So uh, I assume you worked in the UBC. Uh, and she graduated with highest distinction. And then after she left the, the Berkeley and the MBZ, she went to the University of Washington where she did her PhD with another noted uh, MBZ alumnus, uh, um, Dr. Ray Huey. And while she was there, she had an NSF pre-doctoral fellowship. So one of the fun things to do when you're going to introduce a speaker, even somebody who you know well, is you have a chance to kind of do, as I described it, a deep dive into the CV. Because <laughs> I went online to check out her webpage. And, uh, and so she had an NSF pre-doctoral fellowship when she started there at the University of Washington. And I think she's been continuously funded by the National Science Foundation ever since, which is a very, it's not a long time, yeah. <laughs> it's a long time. Yeah, exactly. 26 years of continuous support and 19 NSF awards of various sorts, which is a, a pretty incredible record. Uh, and so after she finished her PhD working with Ray, she came back to the MBZ for a postdoc. So she had an NSF postdoc here, and then she went from here directly to Cornell University, where she's been ever since. Uh, in Cornell, she uh, became a full professor in 2010, and then in 2013, she became the Goldman, Goldwyn Smith Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, um, which, congratulations on, on receiving that. Um, so, uh, and then, but she did take a hiatus from her work at Cornell for two years, so in 2000, uh, in 2014 and 2015, she, would, she went to NSF and she served as a program director there for systematic biology and, bi and diversity. Was it biodiversity? And um, and uh, I, I, you know, as I was looking at the 19 awards, I was thinking that you really owed them. <laughs> <laughs> you owed them those two years of great service. Um, so, um, not surprisingly, given her stature in the field, Kelly has a ton of publications, more than 100 publications. Uh, and she publishes broadly. Uh, most of her work is with reptiles and amphibians, but not entirely. And I guess I would say that um, my assessment of the CV was that there are three primary areas that she's tended to publish in. One is with chytrid fungus, the amphibian killing chytrid fungus, uh, dynamics, conservation implications, and it's actually an incredible number of publications in that area. I was I was amazed to see how many publications you've had on, on chytrid-related topics. Uh, she's also done a lot of work with ambistomatic salamanders, especially population genetics and population demography, and especially with ambistoma maculatum, which occurs right there in your neighborhood in, at Cornell. And then, of course, she's also done a lot of work looking at diversification and conservation of neotropical amphibians, especially with the Brazilian Atlantic forest fauna. And uh, today, I think she's going to be focused on that third topic, although maybe Kitrin will also make an appearance in this talk. Um, Kelly, thank you for coming and providing this seminar. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, everybody. It's really amazing to be here. It's so, so fun to see so many new faces. And many things have changed, but I was telling Jim the other day that Jupiter still looks the same. <laughs> and this room is comfortably still identical. <laughs> Um, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, I feel like I don't even have to introduce myself in terms of my work. Jim hit it right on. And what I'm going to try to do is today is actually sort of take a higher level view of some of the things I've been working on, try to stitch some relationships between these, these kinds of activities that go on in my lab. Uh, because as always, we think that we might be working on things in independent ways, but it turns out that they're often very relating, um, even though we don't see it when we're doing it. So, I am very interested in diversification in reptiles and amphibians more generally. Uh, I primarily have been working on frogs for the last 10 years or so, uh, but I have a love of all herps. Um, and of course, if you work on frogs or amphibians or diversity at all, um, you know that conservation can never be very far from, from your attentions. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing in these two areas with the tropical frogs. So I first started thinking about this a while ago, um, and basically what inspired me about 10 years ago is that I was uh, just starting a co collaboration with Karen Lips, who is a colleague and works a lot, I've worked a lot with her in uh, Central America on BD and the amphibian declines. And in 2009, she and some colleagues actually published this paper, 
where they basically showed that if you took all amphibian communities and looked at what the effect of BD was going to have, that there was something called an extinction filter, and that that extinction filter was basically removing, selectively removing certain kinds of frogs. Okay? And so I remember reading this and thinking, wow, they didn't call it this, but this is like, you know, what's going to be left over is the cockroaches of the frog world, right? <laughs> and that's interesting. Uh, it's sad, but it's definitely interesting because that got me thinking on how is it that different traits or phenotypes of frogs could actually lead to their persistence or not. So uh, I started thinking about this in terms of one complex phenotype that I'm particularly interested in, and that's reproductive modes. And I did what I call sort of dissecting the trait, which is to try to figure out how phenotypes are evolutionarily assembled in hopes that we could then, in turn, use that information about the interactions or the, you know, the evolution of the traits themselves to try to figure out how it is that one might apply it to something like this. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the phenotype that I'm particularly interested in or have been interested in is frog reproductive modes. Uh, people have been thinking about frog reproductive modes and amphibian reproductive modes more generally. A lot of people in this room think about this a lot. Um, so I'm in no way the first person uh, to think about this. And I can only imagine that hundreds of years ago, the fascination of biologists in terms of reproductive modes was just as keen as it is today because it really is an, an sort of an amazing and diverse set of phenotypes. Um, this is a paper that I think first sort of formalized um, in, in, in some inclusive way, all the different components that go into reproductive modes. Uh, Sothi and, and Duhlman in 73 defined it as a combination of traits that includes oviposition sites, ovum and clutch characteristics, rate and duration of development, stage and size of hatchling, and type of parental care, if any. So that's kind of a mouthful, right? But basically, I simplified this for my herpetology class this semester, and this is what I say. <laughs> Frogs make babies in every way possible, putting eggs and tads everywhere, and popping them out of every orifice in their body, except maybe their ear <laughs> <laughs> The crazy thing is that what do the students remember of this? On the exam, <laughs> frogs don't give birth out of their ear <laughs> They've learned. They've learned. <laughs> this is such an interesting complex phenotype, as many of you know, is because there are so many different components to it. And what I'm going to argue today is that these components individually are very interesting and that to date, I'm going to argue that most of the time these components have been sort of intermeshed in a way that allows us to not see independent evolutionary mechanisms that might be working in each. So if you think about reproductive modes, it matters where you put your eggs, it matters where your tadpole develops, or if you have a tadpole at all. Uh, and it matters whether you take care of them or not. And in general, I think what has been assumed in the past is that um, as you work your way through some of these variations in terms of where you do each of these things, uh, you have an increase in the independence from waters or increased terrestriality, um, and also an increase in complexity. And what I mean in terms of complexity is complexity in terms of the interrelationship of breeding pairs or parents not only with the environment in terms of manipulating it, or also in terms of um, uh, developing and taking care of the larvae. Okay, so it's complexity and behavior primarily. So all you have to do is look at this and imagine every possible combination, and you can see why frog reproductive modes are so, so diverse. So we have basic things like laying your eggs directly in water, uh, probably the ancestral state, the construction of nests, in this case an aquatic nest, by these physolemus in this case a foam nest. Um, many organisms remove their eggs from water at, um, completely, and so here's a green parent of bromeliad or egg deposition on uh, the surface of a leaf. And a number of individuals then combine these. Here's a foam nest inside of a bromeliad axle. And um, all the way to the more derived sort of behavioral uh, manifestations of this, in this case, uh, this is a constructed basin, which this male has constructed himself um, by manipulating the environment and, in this case, uh, stays and protects the eggs. And this is the uh, Leptodactylus bufonius, one of my favorite species, which constructs basically a volcano <laughs> made out of mud, hides inside, calls when the female joins him in there. Uh, they amplex inside of this post volcano, um, and that's where they deposit their eggs. Okay, so huge diversity. Um, all sorts of combinations possible, that's where this diversity comes from. 
So a couple years ago, <coughs> Gomez Mestre et al. published this paper in Evolution. Um, and I read it with a lot of interest because it was basically, to date, the largest survey of frog reproductive modes that has been done. And what they did was gather data on 720 species of amphibians across the amphibian, across the, no, it was a neurons, across the frog tree, um, and did an analysis of how different life stages uh, varied across all those taxa. They had two main findings. The first one is that they argued that these frog reproductive modes, if you think of them as being somewhat more aquatic or somewhat more terrestrial, were actually not some sort of linear progression in terms of evolutionary change. We knew this already, but they re-emphasized re, um, uh, that. And the reason that they could say that is because they show transitions on the phylo phylogenetic tree between all different states in terms of aquatic or terrestrial eggs all the way up to, to um, direct development. So these transitions weren't directional in any way. It's not like evolution is pushing frog reproduction to a more terrestrial state, um, at least not directly. The second finding they had was what's often been referred to as the abiotic limitation hypothesis. And if you plot uh, all the different reproductive modes that they had on their tree according to geographic region, what you see is that most of the terrestrial diversification in reproductive mode happens here in um, the tropical, in the tropical zones. Uh, the idea here, um, or at least the hypothesis here, is that I, there's abiotic limitations in terms of temperature and humidity outside of the tropic, tropics, both in the north and in the south, and that this restricts um, the evolution, or it constrains the evolution of reproductive modes, or complex reproductive modes, to that area. So this is great. I think it's an amazing data set. But there's a critical assumption here. And you can actually even see it, just in the way that these these reproductive modes were categorized. And the assumption, it's almost, um, it's funny, it's an assumption that almost changes the way that you, you ask the question. And the assumption here is that the only thing that could be driving any changes in frog reproductive modes is escape from predation. You can see it in the way they categorize their, <coughs> their different reproductive modes. And here you have category one, which is an unprotected egg and an unprotected larva. Here you have protected eggs, but the larvae are not protected. Here's protected eggs and larvae, and here's direct development, meaning protected and protected all the way. Okay? So this is great, but what it does is not let us take into account the fact that there may be something other than protection that is driving this diversification. So I was interested in testing that, and the thing that I thought was possibly playing a role in the diversification was sexual selection rather than natural selection. Um, what I was proposing at the time was that there may be a possible role for male-male competition in driving reproductive diversification. And the reason I thought this is because by being in the field, what we have observed, especially in the tropics, is that a number of frog mating systems are dynamic and increase the chance of loss of fitness through polyandry. Okay, so a lot of frog reproductive systems include a large number of breeding individuals at the same time. And what this means is that losing fertilization of eggs to other males is a real possibility, okay? So let me give you some examples. We know of systems in frogs where uh, there are plenty of them, where there are satellite or sneaker males. So this is an American toad, and, and here's a calling male and a sneaker just waiting for a female to come by. Uh, in the tropics and in some other areas, we find uh, multi-male spawning very commonly. This is a species of Leptodactylus where uh, a basin is constructed. This is the amplecting pair right here. And you can see there's like no pretense about it. Basically, all these males are just sitting around in this hot tub depositing <laughs> sperm, hoping that some of the female's eggs will be fertilized by their sperm. In hylids, we often see explosive or scramble competition types of mating systems, where there's a female in here somewhere in the middle of this mating ball, and um, the hylids the males themselves are, again, scrambling or competing and often uh, trying to fertilize eggs all at the same time. So there's real reason to believe that it could be costly to mating pairs, especially to males, um, to be out there, out there, you know, breeding in these open, um, com competitive environments. So we wanted to test this, and to test this hypothesis, 
that my students called the get a room hypothesis. <laughs> uh, to test this, we need to know a couple things. Okay? First, we need to know what, what does terrestriality actually involve in terms of getting away from this um, chance of polyandry. Like, so what we did was to score amplexus in each of the species for which we have data as either being exposed or hidden. So let me give, an, give you an example. Not every terrestrial egg deposition site is actually hidden. Okay, so here's an example. This highlight right here that I showed you earlier is terrestrial in terms of the deposition of the eggs, but his amplexus is completely exposed to other males who might be interfering. Whereas this leptodactylus here is terrestrial again in terms of the eggs, but has a completely hidden amplexus. Hidden meaning not accessible to other males. The second thing we would like to know is whether actually going terrestrial and getting your eggs out of the group getting a room actually <laughs> results in reduce, reduction in polyandry. This is harder to measure. Polyandry is ridiculously underreported um, in the literature. We also have very few <coughs> paternity studies for male frogs or for frog populations in general that would allow us to gauge the degree of polyandry. Uh, but fortunately, we have a proxy, and that proxy is testis size. Okay, so uh, basically, Testis size in frogs and a number of different ver in a number of other different vertebrates varies according to the degree of sperm competition among males and in frogs. We've actually been able to show that at least in leptodactylids as well. So in this case here, these are the two testes of this male uh, leptodactylid. We can correct that for body size uh, by using basically an adjusted male body size testis um, percent of body weight. Uh, and that tells us something about the de degree of polyandry um, that this species may be experiencing, at least evolutionarily. Okay, so it's a proxy. Um, it's the best that we have at this point. Okay, so what did we do with these data? Remember, we're trying to ask questions about whether changes in reproductive mode have some effect on the degree of polyandry or loss in fitness in males. We chose two different families, hylids and leptodactylids and ask these questions. So how are the components of reproductive mode distributed <coughs> phylogenetically? Do certain components contribute more to diversity or not? The prediction here being that if we're correct and different selective forces, sexual or natural selection, are actually acting at different points during the reproductive um, time period, that you would expect a decoupling of tadpoles from eggs from parental care. Okay? The second question is, do evolutionary patterns within each of those different components of reproductive mode actually inform about the selective mechanisms? And so here we ask questions about the phylogenetic correlation between terrestrial reproduction and polyandry, or terrestrial reproduction and hidden and plexus, so behaviors associated with mating. And then I'll close this part of the talk by telling you a little bit about what I think is next uh, for this area of study. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we had two families, as I mentioned. They differ, and we chose these on purpose because they were families for which we had a lot of data, but they also differ in a number of uh, characteristics that are important. Um, hylids are much more speciose than leptodactylids. Um, hylids are both temperate and tropical, allowing us to make some co um, comparisons there. Leptodactylids are primarily tropical, but there are plenty of species that reach um, uh, some of the extremes, at least. Uh, much wider distribution and uh, much narrow, just narrower distribution. So the other reason for choosing these two uh, uh, families, of course, is that uh, through my work in Brazil, one of my collaborators, Sérgio Haddad, is a specialist in pilot reproductive biology, and Cynthia Prado, my other collaborator, is a specialist in reproductive, uh, reproductive biology. So a lot of the data that I'm going to be talking about here actually comes from them. Okay, so what we did, um, in terms of methods is this. Collated this data set, uh, the reproductive mode data, looked at testicides in as many species as we could, uh, reconstructed the phylogeny based on, um, uh, multi-locus phylogeny based on uh, sequences that we could find on GenBank for every taxon, used ancestral trait reconstruction to ask questions about the transitions of reproductive modes in each of these families, and then used uh, a, a method for examining phylogenetic correlation between characteristics or between traits on phylogenies uh, in each of the case, uh, de uh, depending in each of the families on what questions we were interested in. 
those were the general methods. You can sort of see what's going on in answering our first question. Do certain components or parts of uh, the reproductive cycle contribute to reproductive mode, reproductive mode diversity more or less? All you have to do is look at the raw data. Okay, so these are the data for highlands. We just orient you here. So this is whether this, this is a tropical or a temperate uh, species. So I haven't even done ancestral reconstruction here. Okay? These are just the tips. This is just the database. We can actually look at eggs or tadpoles. <coughs> Blue is aquatic and then the other colors, pink, green, and yellow, are actually increasing terrestriality. And you can see that there's quite a lot of variation <coughs> and not monophyletic mono variation in terms of egg and tadpole. And then the amplexus is here. And uh, I'm sorry, that was the tadpole, and then the amplexus is here. Right? So we use these data to reconstruct ancestral states. And here's what we find for hylids. So in hylids, we have here is the phylogeny with, again, uh, different egg or tadpole um, deposition sites or development sites. And this is for eggs, and this is for tadpoles. And right off the bat, what you can see is there's more evolutionary action going on here on the egg side. Right? Okay, there's, there is some variation in different groups here uh, in terms of places where tadpoles develop, but at least in hylids, the evolutionary change is, uh, most of the evolutionary change is in the placement of the egg. We can actually quantify this by looking at the ancestral state reconstruction and the transitions on the tree. And so, again, this is egg placement and this is tad placement, and you can see that these transition matrices um, are quite different for the two life stages. So let me explain what these are. <coughs> Basically, we took every one of the character, every one of the states that, that hylids have for egg placement, and every one of the states that hylids have for tad placement, and analyzed those independently in terms of ancestral state reconstruction. We then ask, on that phylogeny, what proportion of the transitions, uh, corrected for all the transitions possible on the tree, um, actually are happening. And, that, and then those transition rates are actually reflected by these arrows. So a thick arrow means that's happening a lot. A thin arrow with a zero on it means it's not happening at all. And a thin arrow with a relatively small number means proportionally it's not happening very much. Okay? So what you see, just to summarize this all, is that the patterns between eggs and tadpoles are completely decoupled. Okay? They're completely different. And the story here is that hylid eggs are always moving out of the water. This is a terrestrial state with no nest reconstruction, and you can see that there's a large proportion of changes there. And there's also a large proportion of changes in egg deposition that happen from water to terrestrial nests. Okay? So whether you build a nest or not, for hylids at least, doesn't matter. The important thing seems to be by <coughs> genetically getting eggs out of water. Now, the same is not true for tadpoles at all. Pilot tadpoles are always in water, or tend to be always in water. There's some back and forth between tadpoles in water and tadpoles growing up terrestrially with minimal or no nest, but the transitions um, on the phylogeny in those two directions are actually the same. Okay, so does that make sense? Different things happening, again, in eggs and tadpoles, pointing potentially to different kinds of selective um, pressures modifying those two life stages. So one of the advantages of decoupling eggs from tadpoles means that we could actually ask questions about those two uh, stages independently. Okay, what about the question of polyandry? So to answer this question, do the evolutionary patterns we see inform about selective mechanisms underlying this diversity? Um, we used the uh, testis size for a 126 hylids that we had. Unfortunately, we couldn't do this phylogenetically, so we're working on filling out the testis size table for hylids. I know this isn't a hylid. It's just the only testis <laughs> picture that I had. Uh, but we are working on filling out the, uh, um, the testis size for both families in this case. Uh, but we can, at least for now, look at a correlation with amplexus and see whether there's any correlation there. And just to remind you, some of the species with the largest testes in both, um, in both uh, families are the ones that are most susceptible or most open or vulnerable to loss of fitness by polyandry, 
and it's thought that this is um, evolution of large testes due to sperm <coughs> competition. Okay, so here's what we find. Basically, we find exactly what we would have predicted. If you look at testicides size in hyalids that have hidden amplexus versus those that have exposed amplexus, uh, you find very small variants and zero, very <coughs> close to zero, testis size uh, relative to body weight in the species with the hidden amplexus. So you basically hide your, hide your amplexus and uh, don't have to invest in sperm as much. In the exposed category, there's still quite a lot of individuals with relatively slow t small testes, a lot of species, but there's also some incredibly large um, species with incredibly large testes. So, um, sort of what you would expect. It's interesting to think about these extremes here. We know very little about some of them. This is a species of Sinax from Brazil. Nobody's really observed the mating system, or we know that it's open, exposed amplexus, but we don't know really what's going on. But that's an unusual investment in testis size for, for a male, 4% of body weight. Um, so uh, there's a significant difference between hidden and exposed amplexus, <coughs> at least non-phylogenetically corrected, in that exposed amplexus uh, average testis size is about 0.38, whereas hidden amplexus the average testis size is about 0.15. Okay, taking this one step further, what can we say then about the co-evolution of these traits on the phylogeny? So again, this is just for hyalids, and what we've done here is used models of correlated or concerted evolution to ask whether the place where the egg is deposited is any way is it any way correlated to the place where amplexus happens. Okay? So to read this, basically you have every possible combination of state. Either you have a terrestrial egg with exposed or hidden amplexus, or you have an aquatic egg with exposed and hidden amplexus. And for hyalids, this is the pattern that we get. Let me help you um, think about this a little bit. First thing I want you to know is that this state is not very frequent at all. Okay? There's only a couple examples on the whole, in the whole HILA database of individuals that had aquatic eggs but hidden amplexus. Basically, it's difficult to hide yourself if you're out there in the middle of um, a breeding aggregation. Okay? So this is what we call sort of a evolutionarily unstable state, so to speak. And what you can see is that in fact, most of the arrows are moving away from that, in that, for example, the correlation on the phylogeny is that if you have aquatic eggs, and, and a transition is going to happen in the alternate characteristic, mm -hmm. that that usually means a transition to exposed amplexus. Okay? Where here, if you have hidden amplexus, the, the arrows go in both directions, and what that means is that, for hyalids at least, aquatic egg or terrestrial eggs can be part of the transition in hidden amplexus species. Or here, if you have a terrestrial egg, the only significant arrow is this one, and that is because hyalids with terrestrial eggs, if there's going to be a transition in the other character, would be tending towards hidden amplexus. Okay? So there is a dependency here on the phylogeny between hiding your amplexus and um, um, where your egg is, uh, where your egg is deposited, uh, that seems to be supporting this idea that getting your eggs out of water is actually a good thing if you're highland. Okay, the results for leptodactylids are even more exciting, at least to me, and I think the reason is that leptodactylids have this really nice uh, sort of not stepwise in terms of evolution, but they have every possible combination of reproductive uh, modes for eggs and tabs that that you can imagine, including some parental care stuff that I'm not going to be talking about today, but that's very interesting. So let's see what happens with them. Um, we have the extremes. There are leptodactylids that have completely terrestrial development of tadpoles, all the way to froglets, as well as leptodactylids that uh, take care of tadpoles that are in aquatic environments. And this is what their data look like. Here are the eggs. You can see a lot of variation where eggs are deposited. Here are the tadpoles, significantly less variation there. Here's paternal care, and there's whether the amplexus is hidden or exposed. So again, quite a lot of variation, not only in the two life history stages, but in the behaviors that are associated with them. So we did exactly the same analyses. 
and you can see here that a lot going on with the deposition site for eggs, relatively little going on with the deposition site for tads, so exactly as you would have predicted, uh, a decoupling between those two stages in terms of the amount of evolutionary change. And in fact, if we do uh, the correlations that I just told you about before, we find that for this family, leptodactility, that egg placement and tad development are independent, that egg placement and parental care are also independent, and that the only dependent model that fit this phylogeny is that egg placement and amplexus, whether you are exposed or hidden, actually evolve dependently. Okay? So this is the hylid correlation matrix I, told, I showed you before. This is the new one here for leptodactility. And you can see that the arrows are, as we would have predicted, again, leading to these two optima evolutionarily, aquatic egg in an exposed environment or terrestrial egg in a hidden amplexus. Okay? <clears throat> so again, let's interpret this. If you have hidden amplexus for leptodactylus, the arrow is very clear and only one direction is significant. If you have hidden amplexus for leptodactylus, you're going to have a terrestrial egg. So this right here, this state is being favored. Equally, also on this side, if you have terrestrial eggs, the transitions on the phylogeny in the correlated uh, trait of amplexus are more often in this direction and that terrestrial eggs tend to happen on the phylogeny with hidden amplexus. Okay? Same thing up here, transitions to aquatic egg uh, are always correlated in one way or another with exposed amplexus. So, correlational, I, can, I agree, uh, but suggestive. And what this leads us to think is that may, this just may not all be about predation. And that's not to say that predation isn't important. There are a number of uh, larval amphibian biologists out there who will take great exception to this because their whole career is dedicated to studying this predation. Uh, but I think there's something else going on here. And I definitely think it has to do, uh, reproductive mode diversification has to do somehow with uncoupling these life stages and at the same time, um, being able to diversify each of those life stages individually. We're filling this, this data set in for testis size, and then we have um, what I think is my pipe dream for the coming, coming years, uh, is to actually get a better handle on polyandry directly. I've been interested in mating systems and sort of fitness of males and amphibians and, and um, all amphibians uh, and reptiles for a while, and it's surprising how few studies of paternity actually exist for amphibians in terms of looking at you know, the determinants of reproductive success. And we have just develop, developed this really uh, fun and easy way in which to do paternity assignment using GBS. And so we now basically resequence hundreds of microsatellites. And my pipe dream, and I'm going to make it happen, is to take clutches of every single species on the hyalid and on the leptodacta of the phylogeny and actually do um, estimates of the degree of polyandry uh, for every species. And then we'll have a, a really good measure of how polyandry itself is driving some of these characteristics in different parts of the tree. So, anyway, fitness consequences of polyandry I think is a big area and one that uh, we will be investing in in the future. Here. Okay, so back to um, I'm going to skip this real quick. This was just some examples of studies in the lab. Uh, but back to the original question that I had, which is how does this, how does this trait, this complex trait of reproductive mode actually uh, apply in any way to questions of conservation? Um, and the question that I asked here is whether this level of variation of reproductive modes that we see in communities in the wild uh, can actually have something to do or affect disease dynamics in those same populations. And uh, we did this by examining frogs with different reproductive modes in communities in Brazil that were infected with BD and asking questions about the relative role of those species with different reproductive modes on disease dynamics. Okay, so the ultimate goal, I suppose, high in the sky, but the ultimate goal would be able to, to come up with a significant understanding of how these species are interacting, whether the, those interactions are dictated or not by specific components of lifestyle or reproductive modes, and whether there might not be the perfect community, a community in which 
those interactions are such that disease dynamics are dampened or minimized. Okay. Uh, so this is work uh, by a student of mine, Guilherme Becker, um, and what he did was chose he chose seven species in the Atlantic coastal forest frog communities that vary all the way from direct developers to species that put eggs in water uh, to species that build chambers and nests and so on. Um, and we categorized them sort of um, more roughly, but according to what we call a host aquatic index. All this aquatic index does is count the tadpole, the egg deposition site, and the adult environment in terms of how much time those three different stages actually spend in the water. Okay, so we have uh, animals with zero aquatic index all the way up to animals with an aquatic index of two. Now, um, I've been collaborating for a number of years with um, uh, a group of uh, biologists, Tim James at University of Michigan and Felipe Toledo in Brazil. Um, and we've been having a great time actually characterizing uh, infection dynamics in Atlanta coastal forest. Okay, so BD, um, there's a picture of BD. Uh, we cut a transect basically from the southern tip of Brazil all the way up to Bahia, uh, 2,400 kilometers, asking questions about what, one, what BD was there, what frogs were actually infected, and how infected were they. And just to sum it up big picture, we think that what's going on here is basically representative of an enzootic state. So in other words, the frogs here have reached some sort of equilibrium with the fungus. Species may vary, um, but this is not an epidemic, uh, such as the epidemic that, that um, was witnessed a few years ago in um, Central America. So this question, does animal diversity infect uh, or affect disease dynamics, and are there specific traits about animals that cause that to be the case, is not new. Okay? A lot of people have thought about biodiversity and its properties, especially the traits of different organisms, um, as potentially altering disease dynamics. Uh, the, probably the best um, worked out example is work by Felicia Kiesing and Rick Osfeld uh, on Lyme disease, where they show that certain species in the community, especially if you um, have Virginia opossums in, the, in populations, actually cause the transmission of Lyme disease to go down. And the reason in this case is because this possum is like a sink for the ticks. Okay? They, they eat the ticks off of their fur. Um, they you know, kill them in their gut passages and so, and so on. So um, this one host basically causes the entire dynamics of disease uh, in those populations. So what we wanted to do is to ask whether frogs with different reproductive modes might have um, some effect like this. And so to do that, uh, Guy applied this framework. This is a framework uh, that was published called the Biodiversity Ecosystem Function Framework that was published in the early 2000s. And basically, if I can summarize this, the way this works is um, it asks questions about the role of individual species and communities relative to communities, hypothetical communities, where that species might be in monoculture. Okay, so a lot of this a lot of this literature and this framework actually comes from um, agricultural applications, and we've just stolen from them to apply this to disease dynamics. But the idea is to be able to partition the role of individual species from the roles of interactions of species um, uh, in, in causing these changes in disease dynamics. Okay? So let me give you the, um, some definitions here. This is a really unfortunate um, choice of term, but these are ecologists, so we have to give them a pass. <laughs> but basically, they partition the effect of a species in a community into two components, what they call complementarity and what they call selection. Now, selection has absolutely nothing to do with natural selection. Okay? Selection just has to do with the fact that one species, if you were to pick that species, select that species, has more of an effect than uh, complementarity, which is the interaction, the part of the net effect that can't be attributed to a single species and therefore has to come from some species or community level interaction. Okay? So is that clear? It's, it's sort of like thinking, okay, this one species has a huge effect, yes, no, and then if the answer is no, uh, then you move on to complementarity as a potential explanation. Now the interesting thing, I think, is, is in both, right? One species could have a huge effect, but the interesting thing is actually seeing the relative proportion of selection versus complementarity in, in each system. 
So Guy did this crazy experiment. Uh, he basically replicated communities in microcosms uh, with these seven species in every possible combination uh, selected, both as single host communities or as multi-host communities. Okay, so he basically randomly selected pairs. He had in the single host communities all seven species growing up together individually. He had 28 single hosts in that case, and then in the multi-host communities, again, selecting these four by four, he had 25 multi-host assemblages um, and uh, infected them all with BD and asked the question, do specific species here have more effect in terms of selection and core complementarity? And what he found was this. First of all, multi-host communities are less sick, okay? So multi-host communities, this is the infection load and how infected the animals got. Animals in single host communities had higher infection loads than animals in multi-host communities. So being in a diverse community already changes dynamics. If you look at what's driving this, this effect is primarily driven by complementarity. Okay? So this effect is primarily driven by some interaction among individuals in that community uh, that is causing, perhaps, transmission to be changed in one way or another, okay? And the effect size is actually negative. And I'll show you what that means here in a second. Okay, so if we break this down by species and by reproductive mode, this is what we have. If you move all the way from the pumpkin toadlet to the Sphysolemus, what you see, I've ordered them here according to the total uh, VD infection load that each species carries. And what you can see is that the terrestrial reproductive modes, whether you are in a single host community or in a multi host community, tend to carry significantly less BD. Um, as you go <coughs> over here to species with higher BD loads, uh, what you see generally is that individuals in multi host communities, here, here, and here, uh, sorry, here, the, the, the non hatched bars are the multi host communities, that individuals in multi host communities for every species, with some exceptions, tend to have less BD, okay? So being in a diverse community actually really does help. How does this look? So what we've done here is actually look at the selection event, but color-coded each one of these 25 multi-host communities according to the reproductive modes of the frogs that were in that community, okay? So red is terrestrial, um, blue is highly aquatic, and every single one of these dots or pie charts is one multi-host community, randomized. Okay. The, if you squint, look at the red, squint, this is actually statistically significant, but if you squint, what you can see is that there's primarily more uh, contributions of red up here. And in fact, if you look at reproductive mode or host aquatic index, um, the selection coefficient either is positive or negative, and it's more negative um, when uh, the hosts are more aquatic. In other, in other words, it's more positive when the hosts are more terrestrial. Okay? So there's basically more multi-host communities up here uh, with highly um, terrestrial species included, and they um, happen to have a higher effect on disease dynamics than uh, the other species. We think this comes because of this guy right here. This is the pumpkin toadlet. Uh, Brachycephalus is the genus. It's a highly terrestrial species that's a direct developer. It's also highly toxic and aposomatic. And we think what's happening in these communities is they basically control terrest the terrestrial part of the cage, force other frogs to be more aquatic than they normally would, uh, increasing transmission of BD in those other species. Okay, so uh, multi-host communities with brachycephalus tended to have higher loads um, than others. So definitely a species-to-species -species interaction, and in this case, uh, predicated, at least to some extent, on reproductive mode. All right, so next steps. <clears throat> Interesting to think about this in terms of the possibilities. Uh, would it be possible to restore communities where selection and complementarity are such that they reduce rather than enhance disease transmission? Uh, we also have been doing a lot of work on these species in particular. Uh, looking at the architecture of disease resistance, uh, looking to see whether black brachycephalus doesn't really even need to have resistance given its uh, reproductive mode. Um, and so we're doing that across a spectrum of a bunch of different frogs with different aquatic indices and different reproductive 
So um, that's what I have for you. I'd like to thank uh, my funding sources and all the wonderful people who have actually worked on these projects, including my lab members, my Brazilian collaborators, my BD Brazil team, and the BD Genomics Books. So thank you very much. I actually don't know if anybody has measured uh, the number of times that BD is, or how much BD is transferred during amplexus. I can only imagine that it is, since that is frog-frog contact, and we know that that's one of the ways that BD is transferred. BD also transfers through an environmental reservoir, because the, the fungus can live in aquatic environments for quite a long time, the zoospores can. So, I don't, I, it'd be an interesting thing to look at. I think that would be great. And it's possible, you could have a prediction that certain frogs with certain, you know, aggregative mating systems would actually have higher transmission, especially in those mating balls. <coughs> yeah. Um, do large testes versus small testes produce a different number of sperm? Yes. And then a related uh, topic is, are all, are all the eggs that are laid actually fertilized even if there was they were in isolation yeah it depends on the species so the, the general correlation is yes larger testes mean production of more sperm um, uh, there are species where clutch sizes are purposely huge and not all eggs are fertilized and there are reasons for that sometimes it has to do with feeding of the offspring um, that eat non-fertilized eggs uh, I'd, I'd say that the general trend is that uh, organisms with, um, I, mean, I think this is pretty much a rule if I think about hylids and leptodactylids, but organisms with hidden amplexus tend also to have uh, sort of relatively small clutch sizes and high investment per egg. In those cases, I would bet that pretty much every single egg gets fertilized, <coughs> even though their testes are small. Yeah. yeah. Why is it hard to have hidden amplexus in the water? You said there were just two examples in the hylids, was that right? Yeah, you got to get yourself out of there. It's, that's why they. I mean, why can't they just go off in a corner in the pond? There are no corners. Pond round. So <laughs> I'm joking. It's frog aggregations. If you've ever experienced one, salamander aggregations can be the same way. Um, they're huge. There's a lot of animals walking around. There's a lot of active searching for females. Sex ratios tend to be highly uh, skewed, and so getting away maybe is not as easy as you would think. So that gradient that I talked about, which isn't an evolutionary gradient, but it is a functional gradient, usually involves certain species just moving just outside of the pond and making a little ditch or a little pool for themselves, all the way to the species that completely avoid the water altogether, even though their tadpoles are still aquatic, right? So there's, there's this is the decoupling I'm talking about. It's, it's just that moment of egg fertilization and amplexus that seems to be the place where natural selection is more most likely obviously to be to so be working. How do those two species that do it uh, how do they they go away. They, one goes up in a tree, they both no, go no, up in trees. But you said there were two that had hidden amplexus in the water, right? Ah uh, yeah. Uh, let me think which ones they are. Um, 
they, I, I, okay, I'm thinking which one is One of them is a hipsy boas, and what it does is actually go to the vegetation still in the water, so they're still in the pond edge, at pond edge, uh, but they make excavate into vegetation and hide their amplexes there. Excavating in the open, and I think the other one's the same situation. Yeah. Yeah, I had to think that, I mean, I sort of in line with Michael's question. I mean, I see a lot of frogs in aquatic environments where there's a lot of vegetation mm -hmm. and they're hard to find. You know, I mean, you, they're calling, you still have trouble finding them. And so it seems like there are possibilities for hiding yeah. uh, while still being in the water. And it made me wonder if this is sort of a two-stage process where, uh, you know, having eggs in the water is really driven by predation to get out of mm -hmm. the water. But then once they're on land or doing something different, there may be additional selective pressure on them to, for other purposes that are non- uh, predation related, right, yeah. in terms of the things that you were describing in your project? It's definitely possible. There's no, no question that predation is playing a big role here. Um, but uh, I was actually thinking, when you go to ponds and there is vegetation, and you can hide to some extent. We actually, for purposes of this study, called that exposed, right? If you were, if you were in the water. But they're, they're sure there's a gradation of ways in which you can get yourself. The extremes, of course, are you know chamber creating species that actually spend 30 to 40 minutes in courtship and then leave females into a chamber where there's no competing males whatsoever. And there are multiple evolutions of that mode as well in those chambers. Yeah. Of course, there are a lot of trade-offs involved, and and uh, it was it's impressive that the vast majority of individuals of, of species seem to be aquatic open and mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, and the ancestral state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ancestral state seems still to be dominant. Mm -hmm. And there must be a big payoff in tadpole ability of tadpoles to go quickly and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah, yeah. Again, the decup this may be not so surprising and maybe it's just, that's what's so surprising to me that we've always always tied these two egg stage the egg and the tadpole stage together as if they yeah. were one thing and they're completely right. completely different. Uh, yeah, there must be an advantage. Tadpole diversity in reproductive and development sites is much less. There's a lot less variation there, at least in these two families, compared to eggs. So uh, it's easy to imagine, right? How great it is to be a tadpole in an environment that's you know flush with resources and so forth. But being a direct developer is mm -hmm. has a tremendous advantage. Mm -hmm. Just look at the Terrarana. Yeah, yeah, a lot of diversification. Yeah, actually associating. That's a good project now for the next step, is actually associating some of these reproductive mode shifts and, and shifts in diversification rates as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there no direct developing pilots or no. reproductive ones? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, the taxonomic That's why content I don't have of, them here yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw somebody back there. Question? <coughs> Can I ask one more question then? Sure. <laughs> so I was curious about the mesocosms. Like you, you didn't really describe them, like how large they were, or what the setting was, or mm -hmm. whether these were like outdoor ponds or just <coughs> indoor cages. Or so they were tanks, ten gallon tanks that uh, had a terrestrial and aquatic side to them, so that we could accommodate species with both. Uh, um, and they were seeded with BD uh, once, so there was a single inoculation in each clay in each uh, tank, uh, and then. Basically, monitored disease <coughs> dynamics over the period of I think it was like four weeks, which is the time for the, you know, the time it would take a normal susceptible frog to actually develop some sort of infection. Uh, so it's definitely, you know, microcosm. I wouldn't even call it mesocosm. <laughs> it's definitely removed from the wild, but that's the only way in which you can manipulate every single community like that. If we had every representative of every possible combination of those seven species. Replicate it, so I um, can't really can't really do that in the field yet. Great, thank you so much, everybody. Yeah.